We hope you enjoyed this teaching from Christchurch Birmingham. More teaching can be found at www.christchurchbirmingham.org. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. Okay, great. My name is Abdullah and uh, I'm part of the team here at Christchurch Birmingham and it is great to welcome you all this morning here. A uh, special welcome to you if you are visiting us for the first time and also want to acknowledge your presence if you're not a Christian and you are here for the first time, invited by a friend or just visiting. Uh, I just say, want to say a warm welcome to you and thank you for joining us this morning. If you have any questions with regards to the Christian faith or anything to do with the service today, we would love to chat. We would love to chat. So please stay back and uh, have lunch with us. You, you are more than welcome here. And uh, we, would, we would love to have a conversation with you at some point today. All right. Like every time, as we come together, we worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, King Jesus. And today, we are celebrating his resurrection, his coming coming to life again, coming out of the grave, this empty tomb. And empty tomb forms a, a, a foundation for our Christian faith. We as Christians believe that that's the place where we find freedom and liberty and strength and grace and love and acceptance from God. And in, in fact, um, one of the authors of the New Testament, Paul, he says that if Christ did not rise from the dead, then all of this that we are doing is futile. All of this, all this preaching and singing and celebration, all of this is of actually no use. And we are most of those people to be pitied in the whole world. Yes. But Christ indeed rose again from the dead. Amen. He did rise again from the dead. And the tomb is indeed empty. Yes. The tomb is empty. Yes. And because of his tomb, which is empty, our tombs will be empty as well. Amen. Because he rose from the dead, yes. we will rise again. Amen. Isn't that a cause to worship? Amen. Isn't that a cause to just rejoice of what he has done for us? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. So today, in the next few moments, I would love us to see the account of resurrection of Jesus from the gospel according to the Luke. And if you find yourself in a different place where you are more thinking about the questions around, is resurrection real? Uh, are there proof? Is there more evidence about Jesus' resurrection? I would love to, again, just chat with you towards the end. But today, what we are looking at is, this, is the significance of this empty tomb for the disciples, what it meant for the disciples of Jesus, and what does it mean for us today? How does that make sense for us today, the empty tomb? So... If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Right, so Jesus, Jesus has already been crucified. He's been laid in the tomb. There are women who are preparing some spices. Say, for example, for us, consider it for reference to be Friday afternoon. The women are getting ready for Sabbath, but at the same time, they're preparing some spices. And then uh, on Saturday, they rest of Sabbath because of Sabbath. And then on Sunday morning, this is what happens. Luke 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb. They and the women went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed and confused about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered the, his words and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and, the Mary, of the, uh, and Mary, the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them like an idle tale, and they did not believe them. 
But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. This was not plan B for God. God did not think that, oh no, they have crucified Jesus. Now what do I do? Maybe he raised him from the dead or something. This wasn't plan B for God. Jesus had always planned to do this. There are moments after moments in the gospel where disciples are sitting around and Jesus is telling them, hey, the son of man has not come to be served, but to serve. He has come so that he can give his life as a ransom for many. There were moments after moments when he sat together and said, the son of man must be crucified, must die, be buried, and then rise again from the dead. In fact, John 10.10, 10, he says, this is what Jesus says, no one takes my life. I have authority to lay down my life on my own accord, and then I have the authority to take it up again. I have received this charge from my father in heaven. And not just disciples, actually. He spoke to the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees as well. He says, they, they came to them and said, what are you doing in the, in the temple inviting all these people in? He said, this temple of yours, you have made this a den of robbers. This was supposed to be a place of prayer, a house of prayer. I'm going uh, to break this temple down and going to raise this up in three days. He said, what? It's taken us 40 years to build this temple. You will, you will build it up in three days. How is this possible? But then at that point of time, Jesus was actually talking about his own body. The temple where the presence of God dwelt in fullness. So this was not plan B, my dear friends. But the plan of God so that we can be made one with our maker. We can be reconciled back to our father who is in heaven. More on that in a bit, but let's carry on. Verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus. About seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Verse 17. And said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas, named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed and well before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. How ironical. He was actually the one to redeem Israel, but not in the way that the disciples, these, these two were thinking that he would. They thought that Jesus is coming to take them away from this rule of Romans and and push them away so that there will be one rule, Jesus' rule. They were thinking of the, from the government's point of view, but Jesus was exactly doing, redeeming, what, as, as the plan of God was, was unveiling. That is what Jesus has come down for. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us, verse 22. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of them who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. And then Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, slow to heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And suddenly their eyes were opened. And they recognized Jesus. They recognized Jesus. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened the scriptures to us? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he appeared to Simon. 
Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. The king of peace. He comes in peace. This morning, if you are troubled in your heart with the situations in our lives around, around us, if you are troubled with something concerning you, this is how Jesus comes to you and he says, peace to you. Peace to you. You are not alone in what you are going through. I am walking with you side by side. Almost his hand upon our shoulder saying, I'm with you. Peace to you. Verse 37. But they were startled and frightened and thought he, he saw, they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and see my feet. That is I, myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved, for joy were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? <laughs> Have you anything here to eat? Hey, Jesus, we are confused. What is happening over here? We, we buried you. We put you in the tomb. What are you doing here right now? Are you asking for, for what, sorry, for, for something to eat? Are you going to eat? What, what is it that you are looking at? I mean, imagine if somebody, somebody walks through the doors and I don't know, how would I respond to something like that? It was like, I thought you were dead, but now you're here. Should I give you something to eat or what? I'm confused a little bit here. Have you anything here to eat? Verse 42, they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate before them. Imagine their jaws open up. He's actually eating, he's actually eating. Amazing. Verse 44, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise again from the dead and that for repentance, the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Amen. Father Lord, thank you for your word, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you speak and things happen. Thank you that our hearts are full because of what you have done for us. Lord, we marvel at your work on the cross and from the tomb, Lord Jesus. Lord, the tomb is empty. And today, as we look at this empty tomb, the significance of this for the disciples and for us, Lord, be with us. Open our hearts and our minds to receive all that you have kept for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. I've got five quick things to share from this passage. I know this is a long passage, but we read it. Well done on, on hearing this. Um, the first one, this empty tomb opens our eyes to see. This empty tomb opens our eyes to see, to see Jesus. Now, everything around us in the world shouts at us saying, I am important. I am important. Make me the center of your lives. Whereas we as humans were made only for one central person and that is Jesus. Everything around us says, hey, put me in the center, put career in the center, put family in the center, put ambition in the center. And all these things are not bad. They are all good things, essential things. But when they become the center, center of our lives, something changes. And the thing that we were made for to, to, to be with Jesus, to keep keep him at the center of our lives and we are we move away from the joy that we were made for we were made to be filled with this everlasting joy in our hearts which can only be found in Jesus everything around us including the nature that God has made for us is a means to which to, uh, to which is points us to Jesus over and over again I mean even physical healing to be honest 
points us to Jesus. Remember those ten lepers? In, in, in one of the gospels, the ten lepers are mentioned. Those, there is a moment where Jesus, they hear about Jesus. Hey, Jesus is healing people from their diseases. Those ten lepers come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, can you please heal us? Jesus heals them. And all of them go on their way. But one comes back. Moral of the story is not that you should come back and be thankful to Jesus. Be, keep your manners. The moral of the story is everything around us, even physical healing, is means to be pointed towards Jesus. Jesus towards God himself our careers our families our ambitions everything around the center person of Jesus Christ and when we look at the empty tomb and we look at the empty tomb even the tomb sometimes can become a place I mean imagine if somebody comes and says oh Jesus rose again from this tomb let's start worshiping this tomb and leave Jesus the one who actually rose from the dead out absolutely not it would be ridiculous for us to start worshipping the tomb. We are worshipping Jesus. Keeping everything aside and around that is pointing us to the center of this. My life should look like I'm climbing the success ladder. What's my bank balance looking like? Where am I going? What am I doing? How is, how is my family looking? All of this. These are good things, by the way. I'm not saying these are bad things. But when they become the center of our lives, there is something which is lost. And Jesus is saying, make me the center of your life. Make me the center of your life. And the empty tomb does that. So first things first, it opens our eyes to see Jesus. Number two, the empty tomb not only opens our eyes, but it also open, opens our minds to find scripture, to understand scripture. The empty tomb opens our minds to understand scripture. I mean, verse uh, 26. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, meaning the whole of the Old Testament. That is what their scriptures was for them. Meaning of all the Old Testament, this, that is what Jesus did. He, he would have gone through Genesis 1. Even before Genesis 1, he would have explained to them how God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit were all together in one place enjoying one another's communion, enjoying one another's presence and fellowship, raising, the, raising each other up, giving glory to each other, the triune God that we as Christians believe in. And then in Genesis 1, he would have taken them through how God the Father out of nothing created every single thing in his creative power. He didn't need any raw materials. Oh, where should I get the iron from? Where should I get the soil from? He just spoke and things happened. He spoke. He said, let there be light. And there was light. And there be light and there was light. And, and the, word of, the word of God, that was, that was the active agent behind the creation. Remember what John writes? He said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Without him, nothing was made that has, that has, that has been made already. So Jesus, the active working agent behind the creation, and the Spirit of God hovering over the formless shape of, of the earth. You see the Trinity there? You see, being there together and then God, Jesus would have taken them. Genesis 1, this is how God created. That points to me. He would have spoken to them about Adam and Eve being, being created in love. Being made in his own image. He would have taken them through the process of how they fell. How they, they chose to go, put God away from the center of their lives. And put themselves, be God for themselves. He would have shared Genesis 3 with them. He would have shared how Moses was chosen by God to free people from the slavery in Egypt. He would have chosen that, hey, I am the real Moses. That is what scriptures talk about. How would Jesus set us free? By giving his life as a sacrifice. Not sacrifice. What sort of sacrifice? There's another book in, in the Bible, Leviticus. If you go through that, it gives you the exact exact idea of what the sacrifice is all about the the perfectness there is no spir spiritual or physical blemish in that that is how the sacrifice would be Leviticus speaks about it and who is that perfect sacrifice Jesus again Jesus again he would have taken them through the prophets the all that they wrote about about 700 years before Jesus came Isaiah wrote hey there is this one who will come and save us who will be, who will die for our transgressions, who will die for our sins and, gi and give his life as a ransom for many. Who does that point to? Points to Jesus. 
He would have taken it through the Psalms where David writes, as far as east is from the west, my transgressions, my sins, my wrongdoings have been removed away from me. Who does that? Jesus, Jesus and Jesus. So as he spoke with those two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus, his, his, their minds would have opened up. As he pointed those scriptures towards himself, he said, look, all that happened in the scriptures was a shadow of what was to come. And now it has been fulfilled in him, in Jesus. As a result, what happens? As a result, this is what happens. They say in verse 32, did not our hearts burn within us while we were talk while he talked to us on the road to Emmaus? When he opened the scriptures to us, their hearts were burning. So as a result, number three, the open to not just opens our eyes, not just opens our mind, but it opens our hearts to believe. The open tomb opens our hearts to believe. Now, if if there is one thing that you that I would love you to take away from here, this is that one thing. So please don't miss it. It opens our hearts to believe in Christ. Why do we need to do that? Because again, from Genesis Genesis three, every single human born on the face of the earth is born with a bent away from God. In the natural. We go away from God. We don't go towards God. We go, we go away from God because of the sin, the inherent, the inherited sinful nature that we have received from our forefathers and foremother, Adam and Eve. And in him, when they sinned, the whole of humanity sinned. And it's not difficult for you to see that. I mean, leave two little children in one room with one toy. They won't naturally share the toy with each other. They will fight for that. No, this is mine. This is mine. That inherited nature, sinful nature inside. And so Jesus comes and says, I will take that away from you, whatever keeps you away from the Father. And I will make you one with God, with your maker. And that is why I would say this is the most important thing to believe that Jesus, because of you, because you came, because I did not, I could not live that life that God had made me to live. I did not live that perfect life. You lived that perfect life. You came, you put on human flesh, you put aside your privileges and you came on and you put on human flesh and became a human being and you lived that perfect life and you died that cross, that perfect sacrifice which was on the cross and then you rose again from the dead. And as we put our trust in Jesus, as we put our trust in Jesus, our wrongdoings are forgiven. Our wrongdoings are forgiven. You would say, you think, why was it necessary? Couldn't God just, just forgive us? I mean, he's loving. He's kind. He's gracious. Couldn't he just forgive us completely? Just forget about it. Forget about it. No. Because yes, he's 100% loving. He's 100% gracious. He's 100% merciful. At the same time, he's 100% just and righteous. He couldn't have done this, like, okay, I'm closing my eyes, do all the wrongs that you want to do. That's fine. I'm going to eventually forgive you. No, because he is God. If he is 100% true and, and, and loving, then he has to be 100% righteous and just as well. And he must punish what is wrong. You don't have to go very far off to understand that. Think of maybe a person who has, who has loads and loads of evidences that he is involved in a murder or a, or a pedophile and imagine if there is a verdict which is taking place and the judge says mm, no not guilty how would we think of that judge i'm sure not very highly and we would describe him in many many colorful words <laughs> but we would not think highly of him how much more for god who is the maker of the whole universe he cannot be just loving and not just. He has to be loving, he has to be merciful, he has to be gracious, and he has to be just. And in sending his son Jesus to die on the cross, he was being 100% just. The wrath which was our portion became his portion. And he died on the cross for us. And as we, today, as we say that, Jesus, I want to put my trust in you. And because of you, I will be forgiven. We are forgiven. And the father looks at us and says, not guilty. 
Price paid in full. Price paid in full. So it opens our hearts and our minds to receive Jesus. If you are here, sitting here, and you are listening to this message for the first time, or you are understanding this message for the first time, I would love you to. I'm sure there will be a moment where we, there will be a point to respond. I would love you to respond. We would love, it will be our privilege to stand with you and pray with you and say, hey, welcome to the family. Welcome to the family of God all across the world. Okay. So empty tomb opens our hearts to believe. Fourthly, the empty tomb opens our, ma our mouths to proclaim. The empty tomb also opens our mouth to proclaim this good news to people around us. Look at verse 46, Jesus said to them, Thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations around us. To all the nations. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not a blogger or a vlogger on YouTube either before or after coming and saying, hey, please like, share, and subscribe. We would love you to do that. This is not what Jesus is doing here. Because if anything, in there were moments after moments where Jesus said, "My, this is costly. There were moments when he said something, he gave a tough teaching, and people around him, they left. And he turned to his disciples, he said, are you going to leave as well? If you want to, feel free. But he's going to keep proclaiming the kingdom of God. So he was not creating this bandwagon where, hey, come on, jump on. This is great. This is going to be good. He was not doing that. In fact, what he was doing was, he was, thank you very much, Isaac. In fact, he was, uh, he was doing something completely opposite. He was teaching them about the kingdom of God and telling them, are you ready for this? This is going to be costly. So this is no bandwagon. They're like, come on, jump on, and that's it. Thank you very much. We'll have to edit that on YouTube. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. Um, where was I? So yeah, that was that was no bandwagon jumping happening here and there. No, no, no. It was not a YouTube like, share, and subscribe moment. It, this is a moment where he sends us out in his strength, and he says that you will be clothed with power. Why is he sending us out? Because he has made us, and he knows us that the whole inside of our hearts can only be filled with Jesus and with God alone. Why does he know that? Because he's made us. And he knows us much, much more better than we know ourselves. He knows us so much more better than we know ourselves. And that is why he sends us out. Where does he send us? He sends us to a thirsty world. He sends us to a hungry world. He sends us to, to this, to see the love of God made known across Birmingham and beyond. He sends us to the 69 wards in Birmingham with a message of love and grace and peace and acceptance and brotherhood and sisterhood and being part of one godly family. That is what he sends us to. And he says, you are not doing this alone in your own strength. I'm going to be with you forever. I'm going to be with you forever. You will be clothed with power, who is the Holy Spirit, as we believe as Christians, that as we receive Jesus, as we say, Jesus, we trust in you. He fills us with his Holy Spirit. And he sends us out from that place to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received over our lives and to bring many to know Jesus so that he is lifted up and made known in all the nations. And so for this reason, as time goes by, as time goes by, some of us would be, would be sent to go. And some of us would be sent to stay. Some of us would be sent to go out. And some of us would be sent to stay. But we all are sent. We are all sent. There's not one special, two special people. We are all a sent people. Because Jesus says so. Third, fifthly and lastly, the empty tomb gives us a hope for the future. The empty tomb gives us a hope for the future. I think we know this already, but time and time again, it is, it is necessary for us to receive this reminder that this life is not what it's all about. Eventually, this life will come to an end. 
eventually this life will come to an end. But there is one that is coming where Jesus says, there is no more tear, no more suffering, no more sickness, no more war, the presence of God and we will live there forever and ever. That will be the eternal life. I've said this before, I know, but imagine if you are standing in front of the ocean and you have a little needle in your hand and you dip, take that needle and dip it in the water. The amount of water that comes on the needle is equivalent to the life that we live right now and the rest of the ocean is our eternal life. And that, Jesus says, in that life, I'm going to be with you forever. That is what he has accomplished for us on the cross. That is what he has done for us. And so there is hope. When we see our brothers and sisters suffering, and we see our family away from, from God, there is hope. Because God is at work. And we see that, hey, my Christian brother is suffering because of something happening in the family. That is not the end. There is hope beyond the grave because the tomb is empty. Because the tomb is empty. Let me pray and finish and then we're going to break bread together. We would love to make Jesus the center of our lives. And we can do that in a very physical way by breaking bread together. We will do that, but let me just uh, pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what he accomplished for us on the cross. Thank you, Lord, when you said it is finished, it is really finished. There is nothing that stops us now from coming to you, Jesus. Because the Father says, not guilty. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord. We approach your throne with confidence, knowing that one day we would be there as families, as brothers and sisters, standing around that throne with our eyes lifted up to you, God, the Father, God, the Son, in the power of the Holy Spirit. We would stand around the throne, putting our hands upon the shoulders of the person next to us and say, hey, isn't Jesus good? Isn't God good what he has done for us? Thank you, Father. Lord, whenever we move and stray from that, Lord, Lord, keep us, bring us back to the calling that we have received over our lives, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Let your name be lifted up in our midst again, Lord. Let our eyes be fixed on you, Jesus, in everything that we do, in everything that, that you, in any place that you have placed us, Lord, Lord. Let you be lifted up, Jesus. Amen.